I think many people who are just buying this captive animal or no, no, no captive, who are buying these, these supported uh, animals, um, they, they don't think about all these implications. And what I wanted to say is that um, many times also people uh, sell snakes and they advertise them as uh, captive, but they are actually caught in the wild. That's also happening. So uh, I think it's very, very uh, important and sometimes tricky to to learn about the past of the animal. Where where does it come from, actually? So so I think yeah, it's it's super complicated. And as you said, you, you said it perfectly. Many people really don't see what's behind of of all of it. And it's always good to buy a snake from well-known source. Yeah. Say. yeah. Welcome back to Animals at Home. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Matei and Zuzana Dolanai, who are the creators behind the incredible YouTube account, Living Zoology. Living Zoology already has over 100,000 subscribers, and they have several videos that have well over a million views. They have one of the most incredible wildlife nature documentary channels out there, especially if you are someone who enjoys learning about snakes or watching snakes in their wild environment, which I know everybody here does. They are just a two-person team for the most part. Most of their work is just the two of them, which I absolutely love. To me, it feels like they're bringing nature documentaries back to what they used to be when we were kids, you know, when you used to watch the Discovery Channel and Animal Planet and actually just get to watch animals in the wild. It's not sensationalized or the, the host is and running around and swinging snakes in the air. Matei and Zuzana have a very calm and peaceful way of creating content that just allows you to feel like you are actually sitting in the rainforest watching a Brazilian rainbow boa come right past your feet. And there's no question to me why their channel is doing so well because I think so many of us yearn for being able to watch content that's not overproduced and sensationalized and crazy. It's just is what it is and you get to sit there and, and hear the sounds of nature and, and learn a little bit about the species. And anyway, I'm rambling on because I do love this channel so much and I absolutely had a blast chatting with them. In the conversation, we discussed how they got into this, how they actually take a, a video from the idea of where to film and what species to look for and you know actually go through with the entire process of making a full-blown documentary we talk about how they film the snakes what equipment they use how they set up the lighting and whatnot and we also finish the conversation discussing the african pet export market you know animals that are coming from those countries in africa that are being sold at sort of a broad scale and it's actually a really important part of this conversation. So I hope you stick around to the very end because it's about a 15 minute part of the conversation where it is so important and we, we discuss the implications of these price lists and it, it, we discuss things that you may have not thought about before. And not that many of it applies to us who are just you know the everyday Joe Schmo keeper of reptiles, but it is part of our hobby. Part of our hobby is pulling wild venomous snakes out of the, out of the wild and selling them for dirt cheap and utilizing the people in those countries to procure these animals in, in a very dangerous way. And anyway, again, I'm, I'm over talking here. This is a fantastic conversation. I know you will enjoy it. If you want to find any more information about this episode or any other episode of the podcast or any other podcast on this network, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. If you would like to join us over at Patreon, you can do that for as little as $3 a month over at patreon.com slash animalsathome. There you'll have early access to episodes. You have the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests, and you can also join us over on the Discord server. We have lots of conversations on a daily basis about things reptile-related. Thank you so much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. And thank you very much to the Reptile Merch Store for sponsoring this episode of the podcast as well. If you're looking for some reptile-related t-shirts or sweaters, definitely go check them out. They have an incredible array of sort of fun and sort of cute designs, but also some really meaningful and powerful shirt designs as well that I think you'll really like. You can use the discount code in the description for 10% off a purchase. Let's jump into this episode. Enjoy. Well, Matei and Zuzana, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure and greetings from the Czech Republic. Yes, thank you for inviting us. You guys have one of 
probably the most u- unique YouTube channels out there and fascinating. And I'm so glad to see how well it's doing because it's just this amazing quality content. And and I don't, I don't, maybe I'm not familiar with how the documentary space looks on YouTube, but I really do think that you're one of the main players as far as you know independent documentary f- nature films, and and they are amazingly well done. And I cannot wait to get into it. I know so many people who keep reptiles or are just interested in reptiles use your videos to you know design enclosures or just you know to learn more information about the spe- you know species that they enjoy. But so, so why don't we just start with where did the passion for wildlife come from? Maybe we'll start with Susanna and then and then we'll go to Matei. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. okay. So first okay. of all, thank you so much. Sorry to interrupt you, but thank you so much. We really are so happy that you love our channel and uh, it's amazing that so many people watch our videos. We are very honored by that. Good, good. No, I'm, it's, a, it's a pleasure to watch. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, because um, it was very different how, how uh, my passion and Matthias' mm-hmm. passion started. Uh, so it's good that we can uh, say separately. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm from a, um, like I would say, biological family. My father is also a biologist, a scientist, but he is um, interested in birds mostly. So uh, I was in the nature from very early childhood uh, with my parents. And um, I mean, it was very natural that, natural that I uh, started to love nature and animals um, because it was like, very normal in our family. So that's it. And uh, I was more focused uh, on birds also, like my uh, father. But then uh, we met <laughs> and it changed a lot. Uh, a lot. <laughs> but uh, I was not into uh, reptiles or snakes before. But uh, I loved all animals since I was very young. And Matei, what about yourself? So. Um... Yeah, I'm coming from a very different uh, background. So um, first of all, um, uh, actually, I was born in Slovakia and I spent 20 years of my life in Slovakia. Now I speak both Slovak and Czech languages. Uh, So we actually met uh, in the way that I went to study zoology at the university in the Czech Republic. And that's how we met. Uh, And I'm coming from a family where... uh, Basically, no one is like interested into animals and nature too much. But since I was probably like three years old, I was absolutely fascinated by uh, dinosaurs and reptiles. And um, and it, it just stayed with me for my whole life. Um, and of course, I was, I was uh, really into nature and I loved all animals. Uh, but for some reason, reptiles were just, uh, you know, the most fascinating group uh, of animals for me. Uh, so um, when we actually met and uh, we started to think about some project which we can do together, uh, you know, the, the idea was to try to uh, film and photograph uh, all wild animals we can find. But I always thought that... Uh, no, I wanted to focus our work on reptiles and especially snakes. And I had to agree. <laughs> <laughs> Was it hard to convince you, Susanna? You were already in the bird world. Were you? Did you have to work to get fascinated with reptiles or did it kind of just come naturally? No, it was quite easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like all animals, so it doesn't matter so much for me if we are uh, taking pictures of uh, snakes or birds or mammals. <laughs> And then as far as education goes, so did you both finish a zoological degree at the same university or where did you go uh, Mm education-wise? Yeah, uh, we finished a master's degree in zoology, both of us. And uh, me, I decided not to continue for uh, a PhD. Mm -hmm. Uh, But even during our uh, master's uh, studies, I decided to study also... um, education or i'm not sure how to how to call it correctly in english it's like um education in biology for high schools yeah so um i got also a master's degree from education so that's it and i decided to um, focus more on um education and work with kids than on uh, actual science 
So that's why I didn't um, continue um, with my PhD. Mm. And what about you, Matei? Did you finish, or Matei, sorry, I told you I was going to do this, say the wrong name. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so did you finish your master's and then continue on school or, or did you call it there for school? Yeah, so uh, I continued doing uh, my PhD studies. Uh, so the thing is that, uh, especially, um, you know, if if you want to do a research project, um, let's say uh, on reptiles, um, it's not so easy because uh, it depends on uh, what kind of supervisors uh, you can find uh, at different universities and so on. And there are not many herpetologists in the Czech Republic. Uh, the same applies for Slovakia. And I would say, you know, it's, it's, it's just not such a common um, topic in terms of zoology in Europe, I would say. So uh, for my bachelor's degree, I was studying white nose syndrome in bats. For uh, my master's degree, I was working on hybridization of uh, black and red kite. So um, with for, my father, yes, oh, cool. so his father was my, was my supervisor. Oh wow, he's a professor <laughs> at the veterinary university here in Brno, Czech Republic. But uh, then uh, I got a chance to have actually finally a herpetological uh, topic for my PhD. So uh, for now seven years, um, I was studying uh, paddle frogs in uh, Central Africa phylogeography of, um, of paddle frogs, certain model species. And tomorrow or maybe <laughs> day after tomorrow, I will be probably submitting my uh, dissertation. Oh my so gosh, congratulations. Me, thank you. So um, it, probably at the beginning of next year, latest, I will become a doctor of zoology, I hope. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is really cool. So, so, so t- let's talk a little bit about the, the YouTube channel, Living Zoology. Where, mm-hmm. Before we get into the history and whatnot, I'm just curious, where does it fit into your life right now? Are you both, is it your main focus or are you both doing other work as well? Obviously, Matei, if you're doing the PhD work dissertation, that's probably taking up a lot of your time. But is this, is Living Zoology just a, a fragment of your day? You start. So I start. Um, so basically until to. To uh, 2020, um, I was working at a research institute. Um, it's called Institute of Vertebrate Biology. That's where I was working. I was basically, it was my job to work on a research uh, grant. And it was also the work for <clears throat> my uh, PhD thesis. But then, um, I stopped working at the institute because uh, the grant grant yeah, was it's, finished. <laughs> it's actually not easy to get get a job in science here. So um, uh, since then, I was shortly working for a travel agency focused on Africa because I have a lot of experience from Africa. And as I said at, at the beginning, I love all animals. So uh, I was I was guiding people on some safari tours. But um, since 2020, COVID, uh, yeah, COVID came, so uh, not much traveling. But uh, since then, actually, our YouTube channel uh, started to give me enough revenue, so this uh, became my full-time job. And since then, I'm living my dream, and this is my full-time job. So I'm really filming snakes, creating videos, documentaries answering to comments and yeah this is my main job mm. for two and a half years already mm-hmm. uh, but it's a different thing in my case uh because i do have another full-time job uh i work as a teacher in a forest kindergarten uh it's a special kindergarten uh because we are outside with kids uh, all day we spend outside in the nature and uh yeah we do have like small cottage hut or something like that where we can hide when it's really really bad weather uh, or where we can um, have a rest after after lunch or something like that but um, yeah but we spend uh, most of our time outside and it's my full-time job already for six years Mm -hmm. six years yeah just after I finished uh, my the university I started to work there because um, actually me, my colleague, and our boss, we started the kindergarten in that time. 
So, wow. yeah, this is, and I, I really love it because I can be outside in the nature with amazing kids. And yeah, that's great. Yeah, that sounds like a better Zena learning really, environment. Yeah, sorry. Susanna is really great at um, educating kids and, yeah. you know, showing them the beauty of nature. So, yeah, she's really happy at, mm-hmm. at her work. I love yeah. that. We we do not have enough of that in our civilization mm-hmm. right now. So we need more forest kindergarten classes. That's really, really cool. Yeah. So then let, let's I can talk. Recommend it. Listen yeah. To it. I, yeah. I don't know if there's anything like that in Canada, but I mean, a big portion of the year, it's hard to get outside, but still being outside in, in you know, out of the classroom, everything is, you know, boring is probably super good for the kids. So that's really cool. Yeah. So then as far as when living zoology started, you get, you guys both have this incredible, you know, fascination with nature and wildlife so so that is obvious but folding in the skill of being a documentarian and, and filming and editing is a whole other ball ball game so how did that did, did you guys have a background in filmmaking or anything like that or, or how did this like how did the idea come about so not really <laughs> we, we basically learned everything by ourselves or almost okay. everything by studying trying uh, you know trying to improve ourselves and what we do and how we do it. Um, I guess uh, the the passion for uh, observing and documenting wildlife was uh, quite common for us since we were mm, young. Yeah. yeah. You, I always yeah. Uh, took pictures um, of, of animals. I started to photograph more seriously when I was like 15 maybe 15 16 and since that mm. so we continue yeah. so when i met susanna at the university she was already uh, you know very good wildlife photographer and um, she was traveling a lot with uh, her father when she was yeah. younger yeah. so she had experiences from expeditions when uh, you were helping your your mm-hmm. father with during research, the research. Mm-hmm. on birds yeah. Yeah. yeah, we were catching birds uh, and taking ectoparasites from them. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and uh, I didn't have much experience from, uh, from, from nature because obviously my parents uh, were not into, you know, uh, nature too much and they were not biologists. Um, but I was always, uh, when I was a kid, I was having some, some small camera and trying to, you know, uh, document even nature or animals on some, you know, casual occasions. Um, and then, um, when I went to study at the university, slowly, I, you know, I was thinking that it's something what I want to do, at least in my, in my free time. And I was always really passionate about documentaries. When I was a kid, I was watching <laughs> documentaries, tons, of, tons, tons of documentaries. So, and I didn't realize it, but it was actually my dream to to start filming animals and start telling my own stories about animals and maybe show how I see animals and 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 this this kind of point of view that nature can tell a story just by itself you don't and and it it's nicely i think we we nicely use it when we work with snakes that snakes are the main actors we don't need to be in front of camera and speak about the snake and and handling it so um so i i bought a very small amateur video yeah, camera before our first trip to yeah. to thailand yeah 2014, 2014 2014 and then yeah we were students so we were saving money for a year and then we went to thailand for a first expedition and we just went to nature with the camera and we started to you know we we tried to find as many animals as we can you can watch this documentary from thailand it's it's only in czech language oh yeah that's true it's still on our channel and you can see that it's a big difference (laughs) so was the idea to go there and actually make this first documentary like did you have the idea of creating a youtube channel or were you just going to go and film and then the you know you use the film later for the youtube channel Mm-hmm. Uh, we already had the YouTube channel. Okay. Um, okay. Really? Yeah, yeah. I think okay. we have we have the YouTube channel definitely since 2015. I'm not sure when exactly um, it started. But it wasn't the main idea. Yeah. It was like, okay, we can put it on YouTube mm-hmm. because it's the easiest platform how you can um, share show it. people and share. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But the main uh, main uh, idea was that we can make some. Um, 
how do you how say it, um, Prometheum? Some can, screenings, like, yeah, some yeah, screenings yeah. Uh, here in the Czech Republic, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like travel screenings, because it's quite popular to yeah. show uh, pictures, photos, videos from your travels here in the Czech Republic, mm-hmm. in the university, for example, for other students and so on. Yeah, yeah. So and I think the important uh, thing to say also is that um, I was... My whole whole childhood, I was dreaming about visiting uh, tropical countries, and I was really fascinated by the biodiversity. But I was I was 22 when I first uh, visited a country in the tropics, Madagascar, and since then I was I was really fascinated by by traveling and seeing the animals. I was only reading about my whole life in books. So I was very passionate about trying to you know, educate people. And as Susanna said, we started in a way that we were making presentations at the university with photos and short videos. Yeah. But YouTube channel was kind of like a good, good way how to, how to edit some first work and put it somewhere and see what, what people think about it, you know. So then was there a point where, you know, you're, you're putting out a few videos, was there a point where you realized, oh, this is actually, could be something that you could do? Or, or were you just sort of creating videos, editing them and putting them out, and, and then eventually it started, the channel started to grow? So Much later. <laughs> much later, yeah. Basically, the, the big uh, growth of the channel came, uh, I think, 2019. So, but I don't know, for some reason, um, I was... But, but we were yeah. not not creating many videos. Yes. Okay. We yes. just made the big documentary. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we, we started with short videos, I don't know, uh, like two years back, three years back. Mm-hmm. In basically 2019, so, mostly, because uh, um, the first idea was to actually create some nice documentaries, let's say even narrated documentaries, mm-hmm. we still... Do this kind of work, but it takes it takes um, one year, or in some cases, it takes six years to create a, a one-hour narrated nice documentary. And uh, so we were not posting so many videos on our YouTube channel. <clears throat> and uh, the first idea and how it actually started, I think, was that we started to go to check nature even mm-hmm. before we went to Thailand. The first, what we did was we started to walk in national parks in some natural areas, and we were trying to find animals and um, and film some footage. And I always um, had this idea of making a documentary about snakes of the Czech Republic, mm. and we just started to gather footage slowly and. I think after two or three years mm-hmm. with a very amateur video camera. Um, we managed to buy a secondhand camera from our colleague, friend, who is now also freelancer, <laughs> wildlife um, filmmaker, but he's filming only animals in the Czech Republic. Uh, so, yeah, we had a little bit better camera and we were still gathering footage and uh, gathering footage of five species which live in the Czech Republic, but also we wanted uh, to show the behavior. And so it's like days and days spent in the nature every year. And usually we filmed like one scene of cool behavior <laughs> per year because yeah. it's really mostly about luck. That's why it took us so much easy. time, like six so, years. <laughs> but you know, right. over, over time, this became like more and more serious and we were getting better and better footage. And then we really came to the point where we had enough footage to make a documentary first ever filmed, uh, you know, natural history documentary about snakes of yeah, the but, Czech Republic. Yeah, but the thing with, with what we are talking, uh, that we, it was, it would be nice to show, uh, <laughs> you will cut this. <laughs> uh, no, uh, that we wanted to show the footage to people uh, even before the documentary will be finished. Mm-hmm. So we started to put it more and more on the YouTube. Mm. And then we yeah, realized yeah, that yeah. people are interested in these shorter um, videos. Yeah, yeah. It started with trailers, but then, yeah, we basically realized, and that was a very in, important and interesting point for me personally, that we realized that we can make a short video, let's say five, 10 minutes, about one snake species. We don't need to uh, go to the recording studio and pay the narrator mm-hmm. for 
you know, narrating a script. But we just put there a natural sound, which we recorded in the same area where the snake lives, and we put uh, information in the text. And for some reason, I didn't expect it at all. For some reason, people, people love it. And for example, recently we had a video with a narration and people who watch our channel are now writing us comments uh, in a way that please come back to <laughs> videos without narration and only sounds of nature and it's beautiful. So I was never even uh, thinking that this kind of approach will be interesting for people. And it's, of course, it's, it's the way we want to present these animals and we think it's beautiful and relaxing, but we were not expecting that people and viewers will actually like it, but it works somehow. Well, it, it, because it's so opposite of what we see on TV, right? TV is like mm-hmm. music blasting, so sensual, you know, sensationalized. The the host is jumping onto a snake and like whatever, all this crazy stuff. And then those videos, I mean, I, I personally like the um, the narrated videos as well, but both are so they're, they're so peaceful and relaxing, and it is what is happening in the wild. It's nothing more, and really, you don't need to add anything to the natural world for it to be beautiful and you know for a spectacle. And that, that's what's crazy about your channel is it sort of seems like it just kind of came like slowly came up out of nowhere because suddenly maybe it was around 2019, 2020. Suddenly you you know those videos start popping up on my YouTube. I'm like, well, hold on, what is this? Wh- whose channel is this? Because it's there's like it's so mis- mysterious. There's no people, and it's it's calm and relaxing, and, and you kind of have to dig to find some videos with you guys in it. And and it's just a, I don't know how to describe it. But when you find it, you go, what is going on here? Because it's just it's the, the videos are doing so well, and they're amazing to watch. And it's not a crazy person flying around in front of the camera trying to keep people's attention. Really, what I think you guys found is you don't need to do anything more than just filming nature to keep people's attention. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very um, much. Yeah, that's what we want to show, uh, that snakes are very peaceful, that if you don't make the action, uh, snakes are not mm. attacking you, they are not moving very quickly or something like that. And uh, because many people think that if you just approach the snake, he will try to attack you and mm. it's a big action, but it's usually not like that. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. we want to show that it's it's many times very different than uh, many people shows to the camera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, during our expeditions, the most peaceful moments are usually the ones when we are filming a snake and we are just in the presence of a beautiful snake in its natural habitat, let's say, uh, amazing rainforest or or a vast desert it's just the most peaceful moments and yeah the only thing we just do is we take out our camera and we record the video and audio and that's it did a mission or goals like a set of goals develop as the studio developed or did you always have a certain mindset that you wanted to achieve with the videos or, or where do you guys sit on that uh, in terms of achieving, I mean, the, the, numbers, really, the only goal we had was to educate people mm-hmm. and show them that snakes are amazing, beautiful, and not scary. And yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. And really, in the beginning, and not only in the beginning, but even later, we had no idea that it can grow and it can bring us some revenue or or even become a, yeah. a full time job for Matej. It really was something what we didn't expect at all <laughs> mm-hmm. it was it was really a big passion for me and i would say at least um, first several first um, documentaries the narrated ones like the last kingdom of dragons and and these older ones i i basically edited them in the train when i was traveling to to the research institute and i was editing uh, during the night after work i just i just loved it really really a lot and i did it in my free time and and yeah the truth is i never had even an idea that this can become my my job it it somehow came at the at the right time when mm-hmm. when the other jobs which i was doing basically stopped so mm-hmm. so uh, this this is really a uh, bit beautiful for me and still the main the main goal is to educate people and show show people how uh, beautiful snakes are and how how peaceful they are and so on 
Yeah, well, and it, it goes back to like what I had said with, you know, I think people are sort of craving that type of content because we're, we've been, we, that's how documentaries used to be. You know, you had said that at the beginning, uh, early on in your life, you like to watch documentaries. I think we all love to watch nature documentaries when we were kids. And then there's this strange change over time that now things are so crazy and sort of Hollywood style. And it's just nice to be able to know that you know, that content can, can stand up. And I think now you have over a hundred thousand subscribers and you guys have videos with millions of views, which is just amazing. But I, I want to walk through sort of how you two produce these videos kind of from start to finish. But before we do that, it, how difficult is it to, you know, you, you talked about a video taking six years to produce by, you know, slowly collecting footage, how difficult it is to actually film wildlife documentaries. What are some of the challenges? It's not so difficult if we can do it just on our own. Yeah. So everybody can start to do okay. these things. That's what I want to mm -hmm. say. Because we are not a big team. Uh, we are just me and Matej. So and, and still we can produce quite a big, I would say, nice maybe, documentary. So uh, it's really... The motiv motivation is probably mm -hmm. the most important thing. Right. <laughs> and hours and hours of um, work at home then yeah. also, yeah. which is not so so much fun as the part in the nature. Mm -hmm. And th that's yeah. the most important thing. Of course, it depends on uh, um, what kind of documentary you want to film or uh, which, and which group of animals you want to focus on. Um, but this, this general... Things like recording a nice uh, background sound, uh, or you know, filming landscapes. You just need to wake up at four or five and go out of your accommodation or tent, walk into the forest, and spend one hour there recording uh, natural sound. Get eaten by mosquitoes in the Amazon forest <laughs> or something like that. It's just dedication. Landscapes also and now now it's great that you can have uh, good cameras which are quite small can they can have like 1.5 kilos for example you can carry them almost everywhere and and as I said then it depends if you want to uh, create a documentary about insects you maybe <laughs> don't need to uh, leave your home city you can film it you know outside of your house in the garden you just need to have special lenses for that some special equipment but yeah i think nowadays you can you can tell interesting stories from nature with quite small amount of of gear and special you need, dedication yes, you need a lot of time motivation and, and motivation to, to do it i would say and and i'm sure patience Yes, a lot of lot of patience. You can't go out uh, today and film an entire documentary. <laughs> yeah, you need to you need to know that uh, nature doesn't provide every day, yeah. and yeah, you need to be ready to come back from a full day of filming, basically without any spectacular shot. Yeah, yeah, maybe next time. Yeah, yeah and yeah, and what I tried to say. Uh, then the then the hard work starts when you right. come back home because yeah, it true. takes so many hours of yeah. are you are you two editing the videos yourself too? Okay. I'm I'm editing everything. Wow. So uh, actually that's uh, that's <laughs> I'm not yeah. patient enough. I can't <laughs> that's where your patience <laughs> runs out. You can sit in the bush for hours and hours. <laughs> yeah. I, can't so, I yeah, think yeah. I'm lucky because um I like both parts of the job a lot. I like to be in nature filming animals or filming nature, but I also love to sit at the computer and actually tell the story and, and have the chance to tell the story as I want it to be told. And for example, put the animals in front uh, instead of, of people. So, and I love it. So, so, um, and I'm kind of an old, old person uh, mm -hmm. who works during the night. So when I'm really into, into my work, uh, sometimes I, I go to sleep at 3 a.m. And, and I'm just happy that I did what I love. And I, yeah, so, so when I work on the big documentaries, it's usually around one, one year of, of work. So, uh, so yeah, and I do basically everything from the beginning, editing, um, coloring. Then uh, I write the narration, I write the script, 
Um, sometimes I write it in Czech first, then we translate it with the help of some of our native speaker friends. And then and the only thing which and is... And then I come with a lot of critic. Yes, and Susanna is usually <laughs> my critic and she reviews all... Every week she reviews every video and she has some good ideas. So then I make changes and so on. Yeah. And I can imagine so people who don't make videos probably don't realize how much video is basically garbage. Like by the, you know, how much filming you do and how little footage you actually use. Do you think it's like, would it be like 80% of the video you take out in the wild you, you throw it or? Um, it depends. Um, it changes over time um, because now when YouTube is my full-time job, I tend to film much more because I know that uh, I will use some footage for the big narrated documentaries, but then I want to have a lot of footage for, for example, shorter videos about one snake species or um, some behavior or even behind the scenes. We are also mm -hmm. film behind the scenes now. Um, but it usually is like seven, eight hours of footage. And from that, we can make maybe 45 one hour um, long documentary, yeah. I would say. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and that, you do have the sort of vlog style videos as well, which is kind of nice. People can see the YouTube behind, like, you know, who's actually creating these these documentaries. Have there been any major mistakes over time that you each could think of that you think, okay, next time, you know, we learn from this? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> because... Um, we are learning all the time and that's that's what i love about this uh, that uh, you can have a lot of experience um, for example from central africa let's say and then you have a chance to travel to florida maybe and you see snakes or animals which you haven't seen before and maybe you think they behave in some way but they behave differently or they live in a certainly a little bit different habitat and so on so we actually made a lot of mistakes uh, in terms of looking for some species in the wrong habitat or looking during the night instead of in the morning mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and it's just the never ending process of learning. You have uh, to be careful about moon. It's a yeah, for example, very special thing we didn't know yeah, before. Moon cycles make oh. a big difference, for example. During the night. Yeah. So now you know we are planning our trips and we are even checking moon cycles and things like that because if the moon is big then it's a lot of light outside and animals are not not coming out because right. they feel yeah. and especially in in deserts where there's no forest coverage so so these are like small things which um, which we are learning uh, on each trip and um, it's it's great to to work with local people and, you know, with someone who has experience with species from that particular country. So that's, that's why we, we always love to work with some local people or we have a few people in our team and we share experiences. And yeah, it's usually really, really great to, to uh, see or, or to hear knowledge from other people or to see how they look for snakes. Because there are different methods, and for for each species, you can use you can use maybe a little bit different approach. So we are always learning. And for example, these days I'm studying um, locations in Florida and trying to understand when and where will be the best uh, time and way how to look for certain species and so on. So I'm excited before every trip. Yeah, but I'm still thinking if we made some serious mistake. I I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. So I we did see the car around. crash from the Costa Rica trip. Oh yeah, but yeah. maybe it was. Yeah, yeah. No, that's not. That's that's an unavoidable thing sometimes. Yeah. No, but it was a bad coincidence uh, yeah, because yeah. it was during night and it was raining and there was a hole on the on the, on the side, side of, the of the road and it yes. was not visible at all mm -hmm. and it put us into how it goes. Uh, uh, so, so. Yeah, we swerved. Well, yeah, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't make the so, car go back to the road. And, yeah, we were thinking about this many times, yeah, again yeah, and yeah. again, and you know, we couldn't avoid. Oh story. yeah, no, that stuff yeah. happens. Sometimes that sort of yeah. stuff is unavoidable. But okay, we could stop the car and not continue because mm -hmm. of the rain. But yeah, we were yeah. only ten kilometers away from the from the place where we were going. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Sometimes stuff like that happens. Exactly. But you guys exactly. carried on and yeah. you finished it all off. So, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let, let, kind of getting on. But it was, but it was def- de- definitely the most, like the, the worst um, mm-hmm. moment on our. Yeah, I can yeah, imagine. Expeditions. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, definitely. Or at least one of the worst. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's discuss how the how you go kind of start from start to finish. You guys just recently was it last week or the week before released the African documentary, the full documentary, the narrated documentary, which was amazing. I watched it again yesterday. For anyone that hasn't watched it, you have to go watch it because it's really it's really incredible. And now, are you in between videos now, or do you have ideas, or are you editing a video right now, or are you just getting ready to go collect film to 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 go again? Maybe you can first explain how is it with the big African documentary. Oh yeah, so so it's not the final version yet. <laughs> oh really? Uh, wow. Because it, it's without music. So um, uh, now it's going to be uh, divided into three episodes: um, snakes from deserts, savannas, and rainforests. And it's uh, without the music because it takes a long time to get the rights uh, for the music from the music studio. Mm. So um, we did this already with the Desert of Rail Snakes that we released, um, you know, the documentary without the music and, and it was not, a not, yeah, yeah, not not all the footage, but most of it. And so next year we hope that uh, the full version, which will be together, it will be one hour fifteen minutes documentary, the longest we ever ever did, with the post credit scene and things like that. So uh, that will be uh, online hopefully next year. And is that gonna? You're just gonna post that whole thing on YouTube? Have you considered, you know, having that for t- so people to, could buy it? Um, yeah, we no. considered many things. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Um, in terms of like um, uh, having a, a documentary on YouTube uh, available for people to buy it, um, if if I'm correct, uh, is there? Yeah, this option is still not available for people from the Czech Republic. Okay. And otherwise, um, there's not, you know, not much uh, interest from TVs or, or anybody, um, you know, and, and still now, now we have the audience uh, on YouTube and our goal was always to educate people about these animals and, uh, you know, maybe change uh, uh, the way how people think about these animals. And already, I'm thinking that that maybe we have bigger audience here on YouTube than if we if we sell the documentary for for uh, you know to a television and they maybe play it once or twice. You know? And it's it's accessible for free from yes. for people all around the world. Yeah, yeah. So even people from those African countries mm-hmm. uh, can watch it and yeah. educate. And that's that's what we wanted. So mm-hmm. yeah, it will probably be free mm-hmm. for everyone yeah. on YouTube. Well, it goes back to the mission of educating, having you know a spot for people to be educated about these species. So that, that's really amazing. I can't wait to see that now. So mm-hmm. so so now you so that's kind of on the back burner, slowly working. And I imagine that there's other projects in the works. You talked about Florida. So how how does it work? Do you how do you decide? the next location or the next group of species? Is this just like flip through a book and, or do you have somebody that asks you to do something or, or what? Um, you know, so um, I think, uh, first of all, uh, I would say that uh, our mm, little advantage in this work um, is that we come from um, biology background, zoology background. So, um, and I have to say, I, uh, usually have a plan for like one or two, three years ahead. Uh, COVID a little bit changed this because my yeah. plans uh, were, for example, Australia and countries where you can't travel for two years. So, so we learned to change plans and actually go somewhere where we can go and film yeah, footage there. We were very opportunistic. opportunistic. <laughs> yeah, we, we learned to be opportunistic. Um, but... Um, Back to the biology background, um, it gives us, you know, some interesting ideas about, for example, let's say um, animals uh, with convergent evolution or, you know, for example, snakes with convergent evolution or um, a project about, uh, for example, rattlesnakes um, of Arizona. So because we are zoologists, we know which animals live in which habitats in which parts of the world and i think it brings new ideas about 
what kind of stories we can tell um, and where we can tell them. So, uh, so, and mm, I, I basically have a goal of um, filming um, most of the important venomous snakes from around the world. So this is uh, the mission which which we have, and uh, it's not a big target. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it took a lot of time, but now basically Australia is missing for us and we are going there um, basically After basically Florida. from the USA. Okay. So uh, we are going to the USA now and then to Australia to film a big documentary about uh, venomous snakes of Australia. How long will you be there? Uh, two months. Yeah, oh, it wow. will be mm -hmm. one month in the US and yeah. two months in Australia. Yeah. I took non-paid vacation okay, from I was gonna ask. Garden yeah. for three months. So yeah, so this is the uh, longest yeah. trip. This is the longest trip we ever had. And I'm already preparing videos now. So we have some videos on our channel during the time when we will be uh you know uh in the nature filming and so on. So so yeah, we have many plans, many ideas, and it's usually just about time and finances um, and we try to you know squeeze as many ideas as we can <laughs> to our schedule yeah yeah wow that's amazing so so let's just fast forward let's say you're in one of these settings either Australia or Florida and you have a, a target list of species that you want to get uh, what what's the next step I mean, you know you like you said you're both zoologists so you know where these animals are probably existing and, and probably what time of day they're going to be active but then it's it's one thing knowing where they are and another thing actually capturing them on film and getting decent shots so how do you yeah. how do you bridge that you walk and walk <laughs> and walk and walk no, that's, <laughs> and usually yeah. in a bad weather and it's a lot of mud everywhere and it's raining or it's very hot or something yeah so yeah. that's that's the normal usual part of that that you never know if you will find uh, your target species. That's, that's why it's it's basically a very risky job because <laughs> you have certain story. And let's say when you go to Australia, uh, one of the main targets for your documentary are uh, taipans, for example. And those snakes are not easy to find. And, and it's the same with like mambas, king cobras, you, we usually have very different um, and difficult target species to find. So first of all, we do a lot of research about um, locations. Um, so locations, you know, you can try to contact some people from the countries where you go. You can uh, always uh, see if someone is interested to work with you and help you to find certain species. And again, it's much more easy now for us because mm -hmm. we are well known. We can show our, our work and uh, people are quite open yeah. to work with us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's it's great. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's even, even surprising for us that people are willing to share some secret locations with us because, you know, hopefully they, they saw our channel. They know that our mission is, you know, to find those snakes, film them, release them and educate people about this animal. So, so on every trip, we are um, cooperating with someone, someone local. And also um, we try to incorporate, for example, the human snake conflict, snake bite topic into our documentaries. So or some research. Research. So we like to work with people who extract venom, people who rescue snakes, um, some researchers, telemetric projects, stuff like that. So um, that that brings us to local people who uh, help us, and they usually become core members of our team. Um, and then, uh, then as we said before, you need to study the right season for the snake. Um, you try to go through uh, different, you know, sources online. And again, we have a small advantage that we have access to many research papers some you know some journals uh, uh, they don't have open access but through through the university where I'm still you know a PhD student I'm able to to basically access almost all research uh, papers so that can help a lot also um, 
Yeah, and yeah, I would say those are those are the most important things. But essentially, when you arrive to a location, to a spot, it's it's a big game which starts, and uh, and it's up to you how much effort you put in. And we try to find uh, our target species, and sometimes we go into the mode that we sleep three, four hours um, every day for a week. And it, it comes into, we call it hardcore herping, <laughs> where we road cruise until 2 a.m. And then uh, if you want to film uh, some snakes, then you go to film snakes uh, straight away. Um, and then I go to sleep at four, but I want to wake up uh, at the sunrise to have beautiful light for another snake. Uh, and it goes like this. Um, so yeah, um, it's sometimes not easy, but uh, we are really passionate about this. And so uh, yeah, that's how it usually works. Yeah, that's amazing. So I know if you're working with research teams and whatnot, you guys are collecting, helping collect the animals. I'm sure they sort of do measurements and, and tag them and whatnot. Is that an opportunity for you to film? Obviously, you can film the actual, you know, capture and bagging and whatnot. But then once you release them back into the environment, is that an opportunity to get some good footage of them moving through? Or, or are they too stressed and it's too chaotic? I would say mm, it's, not. it's usually a good chance to, to mm. get some, some footage. Of course. Yeah. And for um, most of our like those basic uh, basic videos or basic footage, we have to capture the snake. Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. not easy to film snakes in situ because they disappear very quickly. Right. So uh, if you want to film a snake, uh, you need a little bit of handling, and we do it in the way that we handle the snake, but uh, very naturally. And after a few minutes, the snake is calm and. Uh, behaves naturally mm -hmm. slithers look around and so on so that's what we want to film the nature of behavior of course mm -hmm. but you can do it without catching the snake or you can of course we do have also many uh like behavior um shots or behavior mm -hmm. yeah. footage um when the snake is eating or mating or something like that you can't touch the snake in these moments and you have to film directly but if you want just some details or movement, uh, we have to work with the snake a bit. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing that if you if you are calm and uh, gentle, snake is also relaxed and not not nervous at all, and it, it mm -hmm. can work even with mambas, for example. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, when we film some research project, it's usually a video focus on the research project or a scene about the research. Uh, for example, when you have telemetry projects, projects uh, you you can't uh, you can't remove the snake to a better location where is where there is a little bit better light, for example, because you will compromise the data. So then it's just about getting what we can. Uh, but as Susanna said, uh, the the core part of our work uh, is that we we find the snake. And if we can, we work with it uh, on the spot or uh, we catch the snake. And for example, next day in the morning, if we find it, find it during the night, uh, we find a proper nice area and spot where we will work with the snake. And, you know, it's good for safety of the snake and safety um, uh, of us because uh, working with the venomous snake is very obviously very dangerous. And um, and mostly we find snakes in the places where it's absolutely impossible to to work with a two meters long bushmaster, for example, dense vegetation and so on. Uh, but as Susanna said, we work with the snake in a way that we basically almost don't touch it for a long periods of time. That that's that's. Um, the advantage of uh, actually thinking ahead about the spot where you want to work with the snake, because if you pick a good spot, you can basically release the snake there and you can observe what it does. And we often, we just have our cameras in front of us and we look what's happening. And when you are not making fast movements and not touching the snake, not scaring the snake, many, many snakes, they just start to behave naturally. Mm -hmm. And they just go, the vipers, they go somewhere behind uh, behind the bush, under the bush, they coil themselves and they stay there. 
So when the snake stops, I can film details of the scales, details of the head. When it starts to move, I take my camera from the tripod. I, I make a movement shot, and this is how it works. We just operate around the snake, and the, the snake in the nature is the main scene, and we are just uh, trying to capture most of it. Yeah, and of, <clears throat> of course, welfare of the animal is yeah. very important for right. us. Uh, so we do have quite strict protocol how to how to do all these things. For example, we always uh, release the snake at the exactly same spot where we found it. Uh, we never touch venomous snakes uh, by hands. We always use uh, tools like uh, snake tongs, snake hooks, which is uh, gentle for the snake and also very safe for us. Uh, what else? Uh, we don't keep snakes for a longer time, just for one day. For example, if we find it during the night, we film it next day during the, uh, the morning, for example. Um, I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah, those are the, the most, yeah, those are the important, most things. important things, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, when when it's when we see the footage, the Bushmaster, for example, it just seems like it's a relaxed. Like it, it ne that's why I ask because it never seems like the snakes that you're filming are you know panicked or trying to get away from a predator or you know tongues flicking mm -hmm. fast or whatnot. They're all relaxed yeah. and sort of in that exploratory mode. And then the thing you can see it on the animal if it's right. stressed and exactly. panicked and so on. So it's also our target yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to film the natural behavior. Yeah, but as it's usually said in a way that. Uh, Calm person or calm handler equals calm snake. So it depends how how you handle the snake or how you behave around the snake. And that's why we we don't like most of the snake programs which you can see out there because it's obvious that um, people who are presenting uh, these shows they have the option to be calm and present the snake in a calm way, but they Instead, they do it in this kind of dramatic way. And I think it's, it's just, uh, uh, you know, bad presentation for, for the animal mm -hmm. because the animal looks agitated and, and nervous. And the, 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 the interesting thing is that this happens to us very often. Before we start to work with a certain uh, deadly venomous snake species, um, uh, we ask people who work with these snakes, for example, we ask locals, and very often people tell us, oh, they're still pearls. They are so aggressive, really, really dangerous. And we work with, I don't know, 25 individuals during two trips to Costa Rica. None of them were striking. All of them were totally calm. And this happens to us with other snake species. We basically didn't have an experience with the snake, which was like terrifying and that we, we wanted to you know, go far away from the snake and not approach it slowly. So I really think from our experience from around the world, um, snakes just have this very bad reputation and often it's caused by the fact how people present them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah and that, that, that's why we started to film also behind the scenes videos mm -hmm. because we wanted to show uh, how we were and um, that if you are calm, the snake is also calm and mm -hmm. No drama. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely the way to do it. And as far as equipment used, maybe this is a little bit too nerdy for people, but maybe you could tell us the cameras you're using or the type of equipment you're using to get these shots. Do you have, are you using lighting and then what type of cameras? Mm -hmm. So um, the equipment which we have is uh, actually quite basic, I would say, in terms of numbers. Um, uh, iPhone? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> iPhone not. Uh, yeah, old iPhone 6. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, or drone. So, yeah, we we have, um, now we have two drones, but we, we basically bought the second one before our summer holiday to Croatia and Montenegro. So our main drone until now was Mavic Air, which mm -hmm. is now quite an old drone, but it's it's quite small, good for traveling. Um, then now we have DJI Mini 2, which is also, also a tiny, basic one, basic yeah, small one. one. Um, and then our main camera is Canon GX10. It's a small, uh, let's say semi-professional probably in terms of the price and, and what it can do. But interesting camera. thing is that it's really video camera. It's a video camera. It's not, right, a, yeah. it's not a camera, but yeah, video yeah. camera because uh, we don't like 
for filming, you mm-hmm. don't like uh, changing lenses. Yeah. Because you have to be very flexible if you film venomous snake. Mm-hmm. You, in the same moment, need to uh, make shot of the scale, some details, for example, and then the whole environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah. it would be difficult to change lenses in yeah. the time you are working with the venomous snake. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's also a matter of safety, like changing lenses all the time and having a cobra in front of you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not the, the safest thing to do. Yeah, so, but, but that's how we do it uh, for pictures. Because usually we do in the way that uh, Mathieu films and I do take pictures. Yeah. So, yeah. And for uh, for pictures, photographs, uh, we use Nikon. D750. It's uh, also nothing special, I would say. Yeah, yeah. it's also yeah. like semi-professional mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Mirror, mirrorless. mirrorless. Yeah, yeah, just a DSLR or a DSLR. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and we do have a few, I mean, five, maybe five mm. uh, lenses, uh, 300 millimeter stellar lens, and then macro lens and wide angle or wide, wide lens for wide angle shots. And we use uh, flashlights and some other mm-hmm. things, yeah. but nothing real special. And for filming, no yeah, and for filming, also yeah, we do. Scenes. Yes, but I want mm-hmm. to. Yeah, yeah, of course. We do have another camera, GoPro camera mm-hmm. for behind the scenes, and uh, but for filming in the night, we usually use uh, lights. Mm-hmm. We use uh, LED lenser headlamps, mm-hmm. which are really good not only for uh, looking for snakes, but also for filming because uh, they have like anti flickering mm-hmm. something. <laughs> So it's a good light also for filming. Yeah, it's very yeah. strong. So we can mm-hmm. recommend this also. Yeah, before we had different uh, lights for filming, mm-hmm. uh, but you still have to hold it in your hand. And now we have our our head torches and both hands are free for operating the camera. Mm-hmm. And when I'm moving the head, when the snake is moving, I'm basically you know lighting the whole scene. And so it's perfect and it, it, it works well. Yeah. And and this is basically everything. And then yeah, tripod for, for video camera. So which is like a normal size tripod, let's say maybe when you compress it, it's like meter, under meter. Mm-hmm. So we usually travel with big backpacks and we put their tripod, uh, snake hook, snake tongs, and flashlights and all these things. And um the, the cameras, drones, or you know the smaller things. Mm-hmm. When we when we are on the location already, we can put all of these things in, into a small backpack. We we really don't look like a like a film crew or something like that. We look like normal tourists when when we have all our things in our small backpacks. Which is good sometimes. Which is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you each have a favorite moment or a favorite footage that you've captured? Um, I'm not sure if you each have a separate one or, or, or is, it, is that too hard to choose from? What would you say? I'm not sure. Um, I really like our documentary from uh, the Czech Republic, Snakes of the Czech Republic, because there are many, um, many moments from the life of snakes, many mm-hmm. like behavior things. Uh, there's, there, there are a few hands and also... Uh, mating and uh, male combats and other things like that, which are li- I like because it's not easy to to get uh, these these shots. That's the one which took six years. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm glad that's your favorite. Yeah. Then. <laughs> yeah, and it's also nice to show something from our nature mm-hmm. because we do have only five species of snakes, but we want to show them, and even those five species are nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I like this, and you continue, maybe? Yeah, um, I, in general, um, I'm always extremely happy to film some behavior because, you know, that's that's the best thing. Yeah. And, um, and I think uh, the Desert of Rattlesnakes was uh, a very important, um, uh, like, a, you know, point in our career. Um, so I like this documentary because I think the story is quite powerful and we have nice amount of species there. And uh, it was the first uh, documentary 
where we used our drone, our current video camera, and uh, all this equipment. We uh, we could buy it thanks to uh, a support from one uh, Czech bank. It was, it was not we, support. We, we, we won, we, we a, won competition a competition <laughs> about the best yeah. project or something yeah. like that. Yes. So. But this was a big yeah. point, uh, you know, game changer because since then, 2018, we have this equipment, mm -hmm. uh, 4K, 50 frames per second, and it's already the best uh, video quality, um, which which we are presenting until now. But I know which footage I like. I like uh, our spitting cobras. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Spitting cobras uh, because it took us a lot of time mm -hmm. to figure out uh, how to. Get a good good shot and yeah, good yeah. footage, and it was successful. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I like I like this footage also. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's uh, having a upgraded equipment. I'm sure makes a big difference, and that stuff is not cheap, especially when you get into actual video cameras. I know lots of YouTubers are using DSLRs for their filming, like you said, you know, changing lenses and whatnot. But really, when you actually want to get into real video camera work, a video camera is what you need, and they're not cheap. Mm, yeah, but uh, it's actually uh, cheaper than um, the normal camera with lenses. Oh, really? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, really. Actually, exactly. The, these, uh, these uh, semi-professional uh, Canon video cameras, I think um, many people don't know about them or I don't know, but for me, it's like a hidden gem. These, <laughs> they are, it, it's not like really... Uh, you know, I would say uh, we were never very rich people because we went to, you know, study zoology or work. Uh, Susanna works in education. So maybe we are thinking in a little bit different, you know, scales in terms of the prices. But I would say it's really in general, the video camera is not like super, super expensive. And it has, for example, ND filters built in. You know, so you, you press one button and you have different ND filter on your lens, which is super helpful when, when for example, the uh, weather changes and you have direct sunlight or then the clouds come in and stuff like that. And, and if you have mm -hmm. normal uh, photo camera and you change lenses, you need to take the ND filter down and, and put it on. And these small things, which which uh, which are super useful in the field. I can I can shoot wide angle shot and then just zoom in and make a big detail of the snake's head, and and otherwise I would need to change lenses. So mm. it's very useful. It's very small and compact, and and, and, and not we, so expensive. Yeah, we don't know the prices right now. Of course, we bought it a um, few years ago. Still and, oh, and the other thing is that yeah. we always oh, buy uh, secondhand uh, equipment yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's much cheaper and usually um, it's very useful mm -hmm. also. And mm -hmm. there's not a difference between new one, for example, between new lens and secondhand lens. Uh, but the price is much, much cheaper. But still, I would say that my camera equipment at all all those lenses. Yeah, once the, you add the lenses in. Yeah, it was uh, more expensive than the video camera. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that's good. a good tip for people to, to know because that, like I said, so many people gravitate towards the photo camera to do their filming and there's like issues with that as well. A lot of them overheat yeah. and a lot of them you can only film for 30 minutes at a time depending on where you live. It's weird rules like that and people forget that video cameras actually exist and it's nice to know that they're actually cheaper than the photo camera. I know that there's uh, recently in uh, the herpetological or her 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 herpetology community, there was the um, Dave Kaufman went out to Africa to film a video of ball pythons. I don't know if you guys had seen this yet, but I'm sure we there's have, many. Yeah. We haven't, haven't seen, seen it. we haven't seen it yet, uh, but yeah, we are looking forward to see it. Mm -hmm. And also because um, we actually almost went to Togo this March, March this year. So it's yeah. one of our plans for future. Okay, that's what I was uh, getting so, to. Oh, there's many yeah. people listening to this that are probably hoping that you guys will go down and, and do a documentary on, on ball pythons and other animals in that area. And so that is on the list then? Yes, that is on the yeah. list. And we were almost going there in March, but then India opened borders and I love India and I was not there for, I think, three years. So I decided so to go to it India. It was really like, we almost bought uh, air tickets to Togo yeah. and then it was like, 
just check for the last time that India is still closed. Oh no, India is opening borders. Okay, no, let's go to India yeah. <laughs> and so go next year. So it was it was really difficult. It was like king cobras, you know, mambas, carbon vipers. I, I wanted to go to both places, but we had to choose just one. Because we are still missing the fourth mamba. Yeah, it's the last mamba species which is missing. So we definitely want to go to West Africa and yeah. And, and what which mamba species is that? Is that the West African green mamba? Oh, the, oh yeah, the green mamba. Okay. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So I, I want to talk a little bit about snake behavior. You talked about you know enjoying you know filming that. Is there any moments of filming snake behavior that sticks out for for each of you of something that was really fascinating or maybe surprising? Mm. Yeah, I will again uh, talk about Czech Republic <laughs> because uh, we filmed uh, dice snakes. Mm -hmm. catching and eating fish and the fish was huge mm -hmm. like really huge and i was i was like no the snake can't eat this fish it's impossible but two hours later or maybe one hour later the fish was inside the snake wow. <laughs> the snake was moving to the water and yeah. disappearing yeah. <laughs> amazing so, yeah, yeah. I, would, I would say in general um we learned that uh, we should never um, put snakes into some boxes. Like, let's say, uh, think that this species is only terrestrial because people think so, or you read it uh, online. You know, uh, even from people who maybe you know keep these snakes and and they think that the snake just needs to needs to live in this kind of environment. From our experience, uh, you know, um, in the nature, there are usually not very strict uh, borders between habitats and it's very variable. And we find snakes in maybe sometimes very surprising places like rhinoceros, vipers in a very dry forests. And people usually think that they need super high humidity. Mm -hmm. And when we post our pictures, some people tell us that we put the snake there and, and it's not native there. Things like that. Or, or seeing recently in India, seeing a green keelback, a snake, which should be a strictly terrestrial, I would say, or it, it should be, most people would say. But we saw it climbing nicely up, up in the bush. Uh, many... Uh, viper species, even though uh, people think they are strictly terrestrial, they they climb. Um, and for example, during our summer holiday in Croatia and Montenegro two weeks ago, mm. finally for the first time we saw a nosed horn viper uh, up in the bush, which is the snake which we have in our logo because mm. it's uh, the first snake, venomous snake, which we found together. So it's kind of like important snake for us and one of the most venomous snakes of Europe. And it took us a long time to actually see it uh, up in the tree in situ. So uh, now we can say it's true. Yeah. We can climb. So I think um, it's important to like think out of the box a little bit, and uh, and just just observe the animal. And sometimes you see very surprising things. And for me, even if it's this tiny tiny uh, thing that the snake is climbing and I thought it's terrestrial. For me, it's already a super interesting, you know, uh, thing to see and observe. Mm -hmm. And that was going to be kind of my next question, but you answered it is in talking about keeping some of these species in captivity is, you know, what are some mm -hmm. things that you can learn from the wild? And I'm not sure if either of you, uh, have you, you've kept snakes in the past, but maybe not now. Is that right? We have four snakes. Yes. <laughs> oh, you still do have. I was thinking with all your traveling, maybe you don't. Oh, so you, you do have snakes. At yeah, we do have four snakes, two ball pythons, like mm -hmm. a pair of ball pythons, uh, milk snake, milk snake, and beauty red snake. Beauty yeah. red snake is the mm -hmm. English name. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we have these snakes for quite a long time, and we usually travel with them to schools, and we we do educational workshops for kids. So, yeah. so these are like, you know, uh, our pet snakes uh, who are used to being handled and we can, you know. They're uh, very patient. Yeah, very patient with three <laughs> years old kids and so on. And so, so yeah. For high so, school students, yes. it's maybe worse than three yes. year old kids. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So we have four snakes, but only species which are easy to keep and we can uh, travel. And we always have someone who takes care 
of them who who comes and, and my brave mom. Yeah, we oh, were nice. recently <laughs> teaching Susanna's mother how to how to feed snakes uh, with mice. And so because on. usually we are we are uh, gone for one month maximum, maximum or something like yeah. that. So, so they the can stay at home without mm-hmm. feeding. But now for three months, uh, mm-hmm. my mom has to has to come and feed them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it was big. Mm-hmm. training lesson for yeah, her right. last week <laughs> yeah. good luck for mom hopefully yeah. uh, i'm sure she'll be fine <laughs> yeah so, be. yeah but when i was younger uh, i was uh, i was keeping uh, snakes uh, all it was uh, always non-venomous uh, species but um, i was sometimes you know um, having some species which are quite bitey um, like uh, tree boas and you know uh, and I was uh, working with them only with uh, books, for example, and this was my way how to how to basically learn how to handle venomous snakes. I was thinking that the snake might be a cobra, you know, or might mm-hmm. be a venomous snake, and that's how I was preparing myself for traveling. And um, I think uh, it, this is quite interesting for me. I'm very proud of it that most of our experience of working with cobras and other deadly venomous snakes it's with wild snakes so Mm -hmm. so we were not like trained before uh to work with captive snakes and i've never handled captive captive venomous venomous snakes that's i don't think there's too many people that can say that and (laughs) we can we can say that uh there's a big difference in behavior of a wild snake and a captive snake so sometimes people for example uh, they they say they found the snake and they bring the snake to us and they say you can film it and we put the snake in in the nat- natural environment and we can see and we can tell that that's not the wild snake you see mm-hmm. it on the behavior uh, how it reacts and we can even see you know um, how we can estimate for how long the snake was kept for example. So, so yeah, I think working with wild snakes gives you a lot of experience and it's certainly very different from, from keeping snakes. The, the so so what, what are some of those things that you would notice as a difference? Is it just in general and a wild animal is a lot more intense in their movements and their patterns of behavior? Or? Yeah, I would say they have um, much bigger personality. You you see much more of their personality if you if you work with several individuals of same species of of um, let's say for example cobras are very interesting in this you can have a cobra which which is totally phlegmatic an individual but doesn't doesn't care that you are walking slowly next to it you are filming the movement it's so 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 chilled. And you have an uh, and on uh, the other side of the scale, you have an individual which which is standing up, and it's always defensive. And you actually want to film the the na- natural behavior, so you you go ten meters from the snake, and you just sit down and you don't move for twenty five minutes, and you can't believe it, but the snake is still standing up watching you, <laughs> and it's still nervous, or I don't know, it's still angry. So so you have these huge differences in behavior of wild snakes. And you, they usually show you their personality. You can have a snake which is totally chilled, uh, doesn't care if you walk around it, film it from different angles. And the second, when you touch it with a hook and want, you want to move it, it starts to strike, it's angry. Those are just examples. Mm-hmm. And when when we work with, with captive snakes, these, these personalities seem to be like suppressed. They The reactions are not so strong. Or if if someone brings you a captive snake and you put it in a natural environment, you see that the snake is confused. It doesn't know what, what's happening. Mm. We, uh, for example, I remember puff feather, and and the snake was just going in circles. It, it looked super super confused. What's happening with it? It didn't go anywhere. Basically, it was just like trying to find a place to hide. But it, you you saw that it's. It's probably kept in, in in a tank or in a small area for a long time, and now it was in this huge space in the savanna, and it, it totally didn't know what to do. So those are just few examples where, where you you kind of see that the snake is out of its place and it's not used to be, for example, in in natural environment. 
So, I can't well, prove it. Yeah. But of course, there are. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 I, 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 I don't want to say that um, it's uh, it's like always like this. You know, mm-hmm. in behavior, you have so many different nuances and differences. Yeah, but for but, example, we had the experience with Ashes within Cobra mm-hmm. also, yes, yes. Uh, which was from captivity, mm-hmm. but we wanted to film it to make a species profile for the Eastern venomous, East African, West African venom supplies. Venom supplies. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we just needed footage for a uh, uh, for this species profile species videos profile for, video them, for them. So and uh, we didn't get a video of wild ashes spitting cobra, the adult one. We mm-hmm. had just, a just baby. Uh, yeah, and it was almost impossible to yeah. get some nice footage of mm-hmm. the captive snake. Yeah, when we yeah. Put it outside. It was not moving, just looking. But yeah. it was, you know, the snake was was not in a bad condition or something. It was just maybe lazy to move so much or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I would say in general, you, we don't get a lot of a lot of footage of some action or behavior from these. And of course, it snakes. was not spitting because yes, it's, it's used, used to, to people, people and, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. These things. So, so, but I can imagine if a snake lives in in a small small tank it doesn't need to move it doesn't need to forage it doesn't need to actively think where to hide where to find water so i guess it, it somehow uh, changes maybe you know the, the way the animal thinks and it's just it more chill okay, maybe yeah, yeah yeah so we that's why we love to to film wild snakes yeah yeah uh, so are there things from from the wild environment that you see that you think people who are keeping captively should implement like you, I think you kind of mentioned it just having more you know more broad enclosures rather than just like pigeon holding a species to a single mm-hmm. environment or is is it enclosure size or are there anything that you think that you when you see a captive enclosure you think okay people are kind of missing the mark here yeah I would say in general the biggest uh, the biggest uh, enclosure you can you can have for uh, the snake is the best and trying to provide as much variety of uh, of habitats, let's say, okay. but um, maybe different temperatures. Because we see that snakes, they they move a lot uh, during the day. You know, in the morning they go to bask somewhere. Uh, but if you come if you come to the spot uh, two years two, two hours late, the snake is already gone. It changes the microhabitat, and and also when we look for snakes, we we for example. You go to the rainforest of Peru and you do the same thing for 10 days. You go to the rainforest and you look for snakes. For five during days the night. during the night. For, for five days, you find maybe one snake per night. One uh, night you don't find any snake. And then you have a night where you find seven snakes. You find two bush bushmasters in one night. Something is definitely different. Mm-hmm. And you know, it, those things might be not even visible for us. It doesn't need to be humidity, temperature. It can be some barometric pressure. It can be something else, some some um, combination of factors. And we see this a lot. There is something what we don't see, and that's why it's so difficult to find snakes sometimes because you try hard, but some conditions are just not correct. It's maybe too dry. Maybe but, something is yeah. different. And but it's in, it's almost impossible to say. What's the thing mm-hmm. which makes the difference? Yeah, that's why I would and say it's even uh, more difficult to to do it in the in the enclosure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's why I would say the the bigger diversity of spots, places, hiding hiding areas you can give to the snake, the, the better. I would say. I think always, but keepers knows that <laughs> keepers know that uh, yeah. you have to observe your animal and uh, maybe learn from his behavior. Mm-hmm. What's the best for him? Yeah, yeah. it, it yeah. can. And help what, you. what I think might be interesting for keepers is to watch our videos and try to see the habitats because we always try to show the habitat of the snake. Mm-hmm. It's very important for us to show where the snake lives, and most of our videos start with the drone shot coming into the habitat. So maybe that might also help keepers. Uh, and are we you- are always happy to discuss what we saw you know or what kind of vegetation was at the spot and so on or they can travel and uh see see the snake yeah. uh in the natural behavior uh, in the natural environment yeah. yeah which can also help and i think it's also 
nice, uh, nice feeling to mm-hmm. see the same animal you have at home in the nature and Mm, and yeah, then you can yeah, yeah. you can make the nice nice enclosure and so on. Well, I'll I'll be redoing uh, a couple of boa enclosures this summer as well as my rainbow boa, and so I'll be going mm. through those videos. I know you have a, vi- a short video on each of those, so I'll be going through those with a fine tooth comb and just kind of like looking for <laughs> different aspects of of yes. that wild environment. And that's what's so nice about the videos is it gives us a window into that, and and we mm-hmm. you know we want to be striving to replicate that. Um, as we wrap up here, and there was a couple other things that I wanted to. To talk about one one thing we had kind of mentioned when we were me- messaging back and forth was the African exports. With this, this sort of ties into the captive trade, and and so what is your experience in in that world? Because I think many keepers, especially in North America, don't realize how prevalent that is, and and how much animals are still being pulled. I think needlessly pulled from the environment for to supply some sort of bizarre pet trade that we don't need. I mean, I always say to people, get yourself on in on an exporter price list if you want to see some bizarre things you know get these mm-hmm. excel files with all these different species that no almost nobody should be keeping uh, i shouldn't yeah. say nobody should be keeping but definitely not the average person and the prices are always insanely cheap like gaboon viper 30 dollars. you know different species of monkeys and whatnot like very strange so what is your experience in in that uh, area so yeah we have a lot of experience with this from africa from uh, uganda mostly uganda um in many African countries, it's still legal. That's the important thing to say. That uh, for some reason, you know, um, worldwide we are already conserving um, mammals, birds, flagship species. But for some strange reason, I, I can't uh, uh, understand it. Uh, it is still totally legal to export snakes or reptiles in, in quite high numbers. And, of course, uh, you need permission. It's yeah. not like everybody can export it, but there are um, companies with yeah. permissions, and then they can export those animals legally. Yeah. So, so that's that's the thing that uh, um, uh, many keepers. We were speaking with uh, with some speakers. We even visited uh, Snake Day uh, in Houten in Netherlands, which is a you know big snake expo, and there's a special room for venomous snakes. We were speaking some keepers who who saw our documentary from Uganda, and these people, uh, they they for example um, buy ten individuals of let's say Gabon vipers, and they know that five of five of them will die, so that's why they 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 uh, buy more, um, and it looks like they don't realize that these snakes are becoming very rare. They live in small um, forest pockets, isolated small forest. So we saw all of this. We we saw how how um, snakes are are uh, caught out of the forest, which is shrinking. It's small. It's isolated, and and these snakes go to Europe or they they end up uh, in enclosures of keepers. And you know, um, especially when we are talking about species like Gabon vipers, which are not like super rare in captivity, and you can buy a captive individual. But yeah, for some thing. reason, keepers, they want wild ones. And uh, uh, yeah, we can't do this forever because uh, those snakes are becoming rare and their habitat is really shrinking. So that's what we also try to uh, show and it will be featured also in our next big And you know, the, the change has to come from those keepers. Yeah. Because uh, it's... They want they all they all they still want those snakes from uh, nature and if they want them uh, then there always will be somebody in in those African countries who will sell those snakes yeah. to Europe or mm. US. Uh, we can't blame those people in Uganda, for example, or that's my point of view, that we can't blame those people who are walking in the forest and trying to get at least some money for the, their children and so on. So they are happy that they can catch the snake and sell it, of course. Mm-hmm. And also they sell it for a very small mm-hmm. amount of money. Yeah. And, but here then uh, you can buy it for quite a lot of money. Yeah, so, so not, yeah. not these local people. Uh, are getting the yeah. revenue from yeah. it also. It's yeah. also yeah, they're not the getting rich care. doing this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, then, no, no. They're just no. getting by, uh, yeah. They can be rich person. The person who is rich from this is the person who owns the company. company. Right. 
but not the guy who is walking in the forest and collecting those snakes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the the difference or the change has to come from those keepers, and they have to think if they really need the snake from the wild, or if it's okay to have a Gabon viper from captivity, because mm-hmm. nowadays many of those snakes are um, breeded. Yeah, they're breeding, breeding, breeding well in captivity. Breeding well in captivity. Yeah. So it's fine. And if the snake is not breeding well in captivity, then it doesn't make sense to take more and more and more from the wild, because if it's it's not working, for example, with uh, rough Ateri- scale, rough bush, scale vipers. bush viper, Ateris mm-hmm. ispida, it's very difficult to um, keep the snake in captivity alive for a longer time. Mm-hmm. And but all those keepers still want more and more of these uh, these vipers from the from the wild. And this snake is very rare nowadays. Mm-hmm. It's it's not easy to find one. It, it takes many days to walk in the forest and find find one. And then if they find one finally, and then they sell it to to um, abroad, and then the snake dies usually. Mm-hmm. It's a yeah. Yeah, I think many, many keepers will tell you that uh, it's great when a certain species is reproducing well in the captivity. Um, I agree that it's it's great if we can have, um, you know, nice uh, captive population of certain species. But the, you know, the reason why we should do it is that we should have some reintroduction programs and put those animals back uh, into their natural environment. And of course, first of all, we, we need to protect the natural environment so we can reintroduce some, some animals back. And this works with some mammals, some birds, you know, there are some programs like that, but uh, I think it's very, some kind of initiative like this is very rare in terms of snakes. And it's usually very difficult uh, in terms of legislation also. And uh, I think it should work like this. And then the, um, the breeding in captivity will be really valuable. And, and we can actually repopulate uh, some areas where some species are already gone because of over collecting, for example, or habitat destruction, you know, so, so if it worked in this way, I think it would be very, very good. But unfortunately, in terms of snakes, I don't know about any like reintroduction programs. But yeah. still, it's fine that there are many snakes that are it's nice population in captivity. Mm. It's it's always yeah. I would say it's always fine, and it's better to have a good population in captivity than nothing. <laughs> but there's still should be a good population in the wild and nature because yeah. it's the, the most important thing if we want to um, yeah, have this species uh, yeah. on this world. In this yeah. world. Yeah, I know there are a few, I, I know at least one, there's a, a group working with Eastern Indigo, the large black colubrid in, in North America that's working with introducing them back into, into Georgia and Florida, maybe not Florida, I think Georgia. And uh, I think it's actually going kind of well. That's with the Orient Society. And, and so, so there are some... Orient, Orient Society. Society. Uh, I think we are going to spend one day there. So yeah. um, okay. I'm looking forward to learn more about this. Okay, day. awesome. Yeah, so you'll, you, yeah, you'll know more about it than me by the time you're done your trip. So I think they, they have some success doing that, but, but we do need more of that. And yeah, you're right, it is a cultural right. shift that needs to happen within the keeping community. I mean, most people yeah. listening to this podcast aren't buying $10 Gaboon Vipers, but there are... That is happening within our hobby and within herpetoculture. So it's something that needs to change. And and also, I think how dangerous it is for these local Ugandans to to be going out and, and collecting venomous snakes just because they know that they can get some money for it and they need money of to course. put food on their family. But but still, that's a, that's a dangerous. dangerous. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, and it's also the responsibility of those yeah. keepers, and they, they don't. are don't thinking about it. We saw. 12 years old kids, kids uh, climbing a tree to catch a uh, Jensen's mamba by hands, That's of course. Insane. And they do things like that because, yeah. you know, those people, they don't have money. They It's difficult for them to get uh, enough money for a living. So if they can sell the snake, sell a snake, it's, it's, uh, it's like, a lot of money for them. A lot of money for them. Of course. Even, and it's still not a lot of money for us or how to say 
And yeah, so they do it and they catch those snakes by hand. They don't, they don't use, use any, any tools. tools. They have wooden sticks at best, you know, and, usually. And of course, they they are scared. So they don't uh, they don't approach the snake like nicely. Of course, uh, welfare mm-hmm. of the snake is not the most important thing for them. For them, the most important thing is to stay alive and sell the snake. Yeah, also... They uh, often don't keep the snake in a proper yeah. enclosure. So you see snakes in enclosures or in, in, in the bags, which are quite rough. So you see snakes with damaged rostral scales, things like that. So when, when someone shows us a snake like this, and I see that the rostral scales are damaged, I immediately, I know that the snake was kept for a longer amount of time in an uh, enclosure, which is not proper and i i just immediately immediately yeah. see it and this you know? is very yeah obvious thing yeah like the yeah. rostral mm-hmm. rostral so scales if they are are damaged because damaged the snake but, is trying to go out and it's damaging the scales yeah uh, because the the guy who, who finds the snake in the forest he can't sell it immediately mm-hmm. he has to wait for the boss of the company to come mm-hmm. and it can come once a month for example mm-hmm. so those snakes uh, have to stay in very bad conditions for a long time. Yeah. And then it's obvious that they are not healthy. And uh, and also the, the shipping process uh, is quite long. And yeah, so... So many of, many of them die just, just even before they are shipped or during or the shipment. Before they are even um, sold to the, yes, the yes, company. Yes, yes. yes. right. So you just think, you know, when you see a price list, for example, Gaboom Vipers, you, you don't, there's so much implication behind 10 mm-hmm. Gaboon Vipers for sale. Like you, you don't know what that meant. That meant that, you know, somebody could have been bit. That, that meant that the animal probably spent a month in a small kind of terrible enclosure waiting for someone to come pick it up. It, mm-hmm. it could mean somebody could have died from a bite. It, there's so many things on top of it that are so unnecessary that you don't even think about when you see wild caught Gaboon. Not that you're, not that people are coming yes. across that very often, but if, like I said, if you do get yourself on a, on a, price list you will see things that will make your jaw hit the floor and then if you add on top of it the implications of of what that means for those animals to be coming in captivity it's it's really horrible yeah this is uh yeah we are thinking about these things because we go into the situation that you come to a small village and you want to look for snakes around for example and you see you see people who are volunteering to look for snakes for you and you see small kids and then you are thinking, I don't, I don't want these kids to go into the forest and catch a goblin viper for me, you know? So, mm-hmm. so I think many people who are just buying this captive animal or no, no, no captive who are buying these, these supported uh, animals, um, they, they don't think about all these implications. And what I wanted to say is that um, many times also people uh sell snakes and they advertise them as uh, captive but they are actually caught in the wild that's also happening so uh, i think it's very very uh, important and sometimes tricky to to learn about the past of the animal where where does it come from actually so so i think yeah it's it's super complicated. And as you said, you, you said it perfectly. Many people really don't see what's behind of, of all of this. And it's always good to buy a snake from well-known source. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. From good well-known keeper, for example, mm-hmm. do you know in which conditions the animal was kept? And yeah, yeah. Yeah, you want to be able to trace the source back, and mm-hmm. no, that's. I think that's a really good point for us to make. So I'm glad that we ended on that note. Is, is there anything else that we didn't mention today that you guys wanted to say before we officially wrap up? Mm, I know. I think we you were talking about many topics, and yeah. I'm happy that uh, you are still interested. So I think it was <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> yes. Well, Matei, Zuzana, thank you so much. I, this it was a blast having a chat with you guys. I, I can't wait to watch more of the videos that you guys produce. Can you let everybody know where they can find you, either social media, the YouTube channel, website, and whatnot? Mm-hmm. Of course, Living Zoology. <laughs> we are on YouTube, Instagram, uh, and Facebook. 
Yes. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we will be very happy if people watch our videos and if they are interested, they can become a member of our channel also if they want to support us more. We don't have Patreon, but this is... Or they can buy a beautiful uh, yeah. snake t-shirt. Yes. I created. <laughs> yes. So we also have uh, merchandise. So uh, we have some t-shirts and uh, the snakes are made from our photos or we have other designs, which Susanna uh, basically created from our photos also. So uh, yeah, we would be very happy if people watch videos about snakes and if they want to learn more about these animals. That's and of our course, mission. If you have any questions, you can um, write us a comment or... Yes, I answer to all, uh, all comments Messages. and uh, answers with some meaning. So uh, <laughs> we are also free. Uh, I want Questions. to say to people, yeah, feel free to ask anything about snakes under our videos in the comments. Awesome. Well, thank you both for your time this evening, but nice also, yeah, it was nice thank to meet you, you both, thank but you so much. I also want to thank you for doing such a great job on the content you're producing and bringing back that sort of wild feel to nature documentaries and allowing us as reptile lovers and, and, and animal lovers to see the wild world as it is. And, and we, I can speak for everybody say we really appreciate that. So thank you both very, very much. Thank you so much for having us. It was really a pleasure to uh, speak about our work with you and good luck with your show. We really like it and you have very interesting guests here. So good luck and thanks. All right, that is the end of that episode. Matei and Susanna, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. And like I said at the very end, thank you so much for actually producing such high quality, interesting content. I know every listener here, including myself, absolutely loves what you're doing. And it really does give us a window into the environment that these animals live in. We all have this deep passion for reptiles and snakes and it's just so nice to be able to see what it looks like there and, and to feel like you're actually in those areas. It's, it's truly amazing. So thank you so much. Listeners, if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, make sure you share it on social media. That does really help. If you want to give the podcast a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, that does really help our visibility in those two apps. So that is greatly appreciated. If you're looking for more information on this podcast or any other, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast as well as the Reptile Merch Store. If you go to the Reptile Merch Store and use the discount code AAHP, you'll receive 10% off your purchase. And I think that's it for this week, guys. Thank you so much for listening and I will catch you next episode.